How do transgender policies affect international laws on women? Who is promoting these changes? In that point, uh, Argentina operates as a testing ground of queer journalism for Latin America. In fact, there is an international political strategy of social domination that goes beyond feminism. That's why we pointed out that employment court, for example, is a way to fracture and cohort the working class. In November um, 2018, um, there was a World Congress on Buenos Aires uh, about transgender health. Uh, it was the first time it was held in a Latin American country, a Congress like this. Our country is a pioneer in this type of le legislation. Right now in Spain, a feminist uh, launched an alliance called Contra el Borrado de las Mujeres uh, Against er Erasure of Women. And Trece Rosas is part of this alliance. The objective we have in this alliance is to defend women's sexual rights and combat the idea of gender as identity. We carry out public actions so that politicians take charge of the legislation they propose and make society aware of the effects of self-perceived identity policies. In fact, it is very important that an Argentinian organization is a member of Contraborrado because we want to refute the idea that in our country, the law has no negative consequences. Here we have no opportunity to discuss the law. Furthermore, society has not yet become aware of the concrete consequences for women because men can take advantage of it to exercise violence with greater impunity. Transgender policies are being implemented as a kill or be killed strategy through corporations and agencies. They usually rely on stakeholders and public funding without any hesitation or questioning. They just like jump on board and label themselves inclusive as if this was as positive and necessary as being green or condemning racism. And this is being applied in the, in the private sector, sector as a, we're cutting edge, right? But also in public and publicly funded bodies that the population that have no further knowledge, they look up to. So instead, this trend, instead of creating the laws to adapt to the society's needs and promote the human rights, this new craze, as it was labeled before craze, is very accurate actually, is imposing these policies to supposedly protect a really small proportion of the population while effectively removing the protection on the 51%. So even, and, and let's think for a moment, like even if these policies were not encroaching women's, which they obviously are, but even if they had nothing to do with us, it is quite remarkable that the systemic oppression based on sex and race has not been legislated properly after many decades of opposition and demonstration. And yet it seems to be urgent that everyone protects this 1%, the ends justifying the means. So for me, who is promoting these changes is as long as difficult to, to answer as it, to point out who's promoting fossil fuels after knowing the consequences. It's just old fashioned like heavy lobbying in disguise. As I uh, said before, uh, intelligent, maybe not intelligent, just very holding you by the neck. Government agencies that uh, appear to be giving recommendations. We were seeing the other day or a few weeks ago, the UN women, UN women were saying people who menstruate. And they just, they, they embrace it. The people who menstruate, like who would this be? The definition on Merriam-Webster, all the, all the kids looking at Merriam-Webster dictionary, trans woman. Somebody rolled the dice and mislabeled this woman as male at birth. So now we have to adapt the dictionary. If anything can be a woman, a woman is nothing. So how does it affect international laws? 
you cannot legislate about something that it doesn't exist. So we cannot legislate the budget, the health protection, there's no subject. So whoever benefits from that, which won't be women, won't be poor, won't be racialized people, is whoever is promoting these changes for sure. It is clear by now the same kind of laws and policies with the same wording even around transgender issues are being enacted in several countries with amazing celerity. This is clearly not a grassroots movement and there's a lot of money behind it. The problem is if we talk about this, we sound as believers in conspiracies. As, as I told you, we sound as believers in conspiracies, but, but perhaps there is a conspiracy. The, the motives are, are very dark indeed. If you read these documents, one of them by, by um, Bilek, uh, I don't remember her, who, who are the rich white men behind the transgender movement? Well, she did a thorough research and uh, it's a very, very um, a careful piece. And I think anybody who, who, is, uh, who has a tendency to believe uh, or, or the trans women are the most oppressed in the world, et cetera, et cetera, when you show them this, why don't they ring alarms? Why don't they see the red flags? What is happening? Evident contradiction here, but they still go with the tale of the most marginalized, et cetera, et cetera, when, when that's not true. First, just the obvious answers uh, uh, that there are effects on women's sport and safe spaces and shelters and all these examples and prisons and all that we talked about earlier. Uh, and also, I mean, I've, I've been thinking a lot about how how we ended up here. I mean, it's it's a massive change all over. It's a global massive change. And I don't think we would have had this situation that we do have in little Sweden if it wouldn't have been for for, for this ma massive propaganda. Um, and I'm not sure really where it comes from, but I have a, some some ideas that it's sort of it's one. On one hand, of course, queer, queer theory, queer ideology, and also a part that w w this whole medicine aspect of it, that it's actually, I mean, you know, about the, um, the puberty blockers, it was before made for uh, ca pr prostata cancer. And then in the, in the end, it, it appeared that it wasn't, it was so unhealthy for men to use it. So they sort of found these new patient, the group of patient to use it on. So that like, this was in 2003, Lupron is the name. Uh, so when Lupron didn't work, it wasn't it wasn't okay to use it for men anymore. They found this new vulnerable group, and they were also volunteer. They, I mean, the, this young people volunteered to use it, so they could just like keep on and doing research uh, on it. So I, I don't know. And the 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 great conservative wave again that came is sort of all these all these different parts that's that related. I don't know, it just happened on the same, on the same time. I don't think it's one, there is not one easy answer to this, but it's all these, all these different aspects of politics and ideology and research and, and money, of course. It's a small group of powerful white men with a God complex, I would say. And I don't know if you, if anyone, if everyone saw this article, where is it? About Martin Rothblatt. So yeah, I'm thinking a God complex really helps to influence the whole world and to give you the inner power to think that you can and then they do. I mean, also on an international level, UN women now being inclusive also really helps to just spread it everywhere and make it seem normal. I feel there's an imperialist quality to queer theory in itself. My feeling or my understanding is that it's really happening that white women go to countries from the global south and tell feminists there, if they are there in person, but they also probably do it online, um, that they're doing feminism wrong and then they have to be inclusive. inclusive. I mean, as they tell us, oh, this is like feminism back from the old days and uh, we're stuck in the old days and now everything is new. 
And it's so easy to do this with uh, feminists uh, in the global south, I think, as white women from Western countries to just go along and say, oh, you, you got feminism wrong. I'm really sorry. Uh, feminism now is inclusive and um, you're just not advanced. Your feminism is not advanced as ours. 